love really is uh, the focus. It's the source. It's uh, the most important value. We're going to talk about it today. It's, it's love that drives people to do all sorts of things, uh, right? Most of the music that we hear on the radio. Uh, love is, is essential. Love is also one of the things that drive men and women to sacrifice for their country. And so today, as you might know, it's Veterans Day. And so we want to say thank you to those who have served in our military. We're very grateful for you and all that you've done and all that your families have done. I'm going to slide this out of the way. Um, love is, is one of the things that drives them. I don't know if you know this or not, but Veterans Day used to be what's called Armistice Day. And this is actually the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, signing of the Armistice at the 11th hour of the 11th month on the 11th day. Uh, the guns ceased on the Western Front. And that war was known as the Great War and later came to be known as what? The War to End All War, which totally worked out. <laughs> we don't have war anymore. No, that's, that's not the case. But the men in the trenches, the men that were fighting in that war really believed that they were fighting to make a difference, that it was changing the world. And maybe a world would, a peace would be secured that would end all war forever. And it's really one of the things that motivates us, right? We want to make a difference. We want to see not just that things are making a difference, but how things are making a difference. When you go to the gym at the, at the beginning of the year, you know you're going to do it. You're going to, I'm going to lose such and such amount of weight. And the thing that's going to make a difference between you going to the gym and maintaining that walk and going into the gym and giving up in February is if you see pounds shedding off of you. If clothes look better on you, you will feel better and you will keep going. We want to do things that make a difference, especially things that we have to do repeatedly over and over and over again. And church can be one of those things, one of those things where you do it week in and week out, week in and week out. And the amount of commitment, the amount of affection, the amount of desire you have to go to church or not, to be involved in a church or not, largely is dependent on if you think it's making a difference. And I think sometimes we feel like being here or not being here doesn't really matter. It doesn't make a difference. Maybe you feel like that way sometimes. I know I have in the past. So what I want us to talk about today, we're doing the Rediscover Park Cities. We're talking about our church uh, over the month of November. And I want us to talk about our values, the reason why we do what we do. And hopefully in looking at our values and looking at them not as a, as a corporate sense of this is totally what we're doing as a group, but what I want you to be encouraged to do as an individual, you'll see how these values can make a difference in your life. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Uh, but by the nature of things, we'll be a little all over the New Testament, and I think that's okay. And so first I want to talk about the big thing that makes a difference, and it's love. Love makes a difference. Look at verse 14. Let all that you do, all that you do, be done in love. Paul's closing his letter to the Corinthian church, and he encourages them to do everything out of love. This is Paul's driving ethic. If you read through the New Testament and you read through Paul's letters, there are usually lists that make appearances in his letters. Lists of virtues, so do these things. And then lists of vices, don't do these things. And they become really apparent to you, if you're not paying attention, that Paul just gives lists of do's and don'ts. But that's not the driving force of his ethic. His supreme ethic is love. He wants everything to be done in love, no matter who he's writing to, no matter the problems that they have, no matter the good things in the church, the things that they're struggling with. He wants them to love, to be a loving church to be a loving church. And that's why he writes what he writes to the Corinthians in chapter 16. The Corinthian church was jacked up. It was a messed up church. We often talk about wanting to be a New Testament church. You don't want to be the Corinthian church. They had some messed up things going on. They, uh, they were divided. They were going after celebrity preachers, which we never do at all, ever. Um, we don't determine where we worship based on who's preaching. That never happens. Uh, they, were, they were dragging each other into court. They were suing one another. Again, something we don't do. Uh, they, were, uh, they had one guy who was sleeping with his mother-in-law uh, or his dad's wife. We're not really sure who that is, but some really weird, sketchy things happening there that even the Romans were like, man, that's gross. Like, why are you doing that? There's some weird things happening. And it's in the midst of this sea of dysfunction that Paul writes one of the most famous chapters in all of the scripture, which you just heard read to you. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. The problem with the Corinthian church was that they lost love. They weren't loving one another. 
They weren't loving one another with a sacrificial love. In fact, Chrysostom, the great church father, says that Paul is describing love as being the summation and the total of all value. And if you don't have love, you don't have values. If you don't have love, and if we don't have love as a church, we don't have values. We're what Paul describes at the end as a, as a clanging cymbal or a noisy gong. We don't really make a difference. We're meaningless. He even goes so far as to say we're nothing. We're nothing. And so love is the highest value that we have at Park Cities. It's the highest value. Now, now you might, if you've been here a while, you might look around and be like, well, I don't see love written down as one of our values. We have five values. That would make six. You're right. It's not written down anywhere. But if you ask a young child to draw a picture of a tree, are they going to draw the roots? No. Why? You can't see them. You can't see them. And so love is like the roots underneath the tree that is our values. It's sourcing them, it's motivating them, it's encouraging them. It's the, it's the meta, meta uh, value. It's the meta ethic. It's the highest value and the highest virtue because love is really what makes a difference. And I think if you stay here for a while, if you stay at Park Cities for a while, I hope that you love better. I hope that's what you do. I hope that you love better. I hope that you love your family richer and deeper. I hope that you love your, your friends, your coworkers, your enemies, your frenemies. I don't really know what those are, but they kind of walk the line between those two. I hope you love all of them better because you're here. We want to be a church that loves and loves people well and loves people better than we did when we were here, than if we weren't here. So love is essential. And love is what makes a difference. If you want church to make a difference in your life, it needs to be geared and organized and rooted in love. And the reason why is because our values make a difference too. Our values make a difference because they're motivated by love. Our values make a difference because they're rooted in love. So something that also never happens here at Park Cities, we get so focused on doing church that we might forget to love people. That never happens here, so maybe, maybe I shouldn't talk about it. But oftentimes we do. We get focused on doing things the right way or hitting a certain hour mark, like we want to get out by noon so we can beat other people to the buffet line. We want to, we want to do things a certain way. And I get this way. My wife uh, talks to me about this sometimes. I get in what I call task mode, which is like we've just got things to do, and I don't always care to do them in maybe the most loving way, the most compassionate way. The point is not the journey. The point is just to get done so I can go do something that I want to do. Uh, sometimes fall into that trap. We sometimes fall into a situation where we don't love because we're trying to do church a certain way. We're trying to do church uh, the way that we think it needs to be done. We often forget to love God, maybe forget to love other people. Now, what happens to a church that does this and stays in this pattern for an extended period of time. We'll wither and wilt. We will wither and wilt. And then one of two things will happen. The Holy Spirit will reinvigorate us, and kind of bring us back to life. The old school term was revival. And, and we'll change course. The other one is we are hard-hearted. We don't realize that we need to change. We don't realize that we're not a church of love. And somebody locks up the place and closes the doors. Because we need to be a church that our values are sourced and rooted in love. And so I want us to look at our values. I want to look at our five church values that we have and look at them through a lens of love and see how each of them is sourced and rooted and motivated by love. So the first one is love is central to our story. Love is central to our story. Look at 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16. They're very similar. John says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Our story as a people, and hopefully our story as, uh, your story as a person, is rooted in love. It's a story about love. It's a story that proclaims Jesus, the Son of God, who died so that you might live. That's the story that we're proclaiming up here through worship, uh, through, through the preaching of the word, through your connect groups. We always want to make that front and center. And I hope that that is also the story of your life, that you know Jesus Christ as Lord, that you know and believe that he died on the cross for your sins. 
And 1 John tells us that the reason why we know that God loves us is because we can look at the cross. I can look at the cross of Christ and I can know for sure that Jesus loves me. Because we believe in a boundless gospel, a gospel that doesn't have limits or limitations. We believe in a boundless gospel. Now, the reason why we believe this is because the story of the gospel is one of breaking bounds, breaking boundaries, pushing aside boundaries. Jesus, the Son of God, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, dwells in heaven and then breaks the boundaries of time and space and comes and lives and is born as a baby in a manger. Then he grows up perfectly, never sinning, becomes a man, and he starts a ministry. And the ministry that he starts crosses gender lines, crosses socio-political lines, crosses ethnic lines, crosses economic lines, constantly healing people and, and casting out demons to anyone that had need. He's constantly breaking boundaries. And then the greatest of all, he breaks the boundary of death. He breaks the boundary of death. He crosses that line. He dies, and everybody is mourning and grieving because they think the Messiah is dead. And then on the third day, he raises again. Why? Because his sacrifice was accepted by God, and death could not hold him. The boundless gospel, the gospel is a story of a God who breaks the boundaries between us and between him. And whenever we follow that boundless gospel, we'll see that it's, it's incumbent upon us for those boundaries to be broken in our own lives. We'll start to see that we'll, we'll be willing to lay down our lives for others, not just people in our family or not just people that we like, but everyone. We'll lay down our lives for all. So love drives our story. Love us also drive our interactions. Look at Colossians 3. Colossians 3.12. We'll come back to Colossians later on. But Colossians 3.12 says this, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Paul gives us a list of things to do. This is one of his virtue lists here. And it's a list of how we're supposed to interact with other people. And if I could sum up what he says here, I'd say... We need to be gracious towards one another. We need to have grace towards one another. And the way that you have grace and the way that we sort of put on grace in our lives is you have to understand that God's grace towards you is inexhaustible. So Paul writes to us in Romans, he says, when I sin, grace increased all the more. So you can never out -sin grace. Every time you sin, grace just comes and trumps it. Now, that doesn't mean that you continue sinning so that grace may increase. Paul also negates that. But God has an inexhaustible grace for you and for me because he loves us so much. And so because we experience that inexhaustible grace of God, we're able to act and interact with one another graciously. We're able to interact with one another lovingly. I need to have inexhaustible grace towards other people in my life. Usually, though, what happens is I have very much exhaustible grace. I will be gracious to you when I feel like it. That's not inexhaustible grace. That's an exhaustible grace. And the, the fuel tank on the, the grace meter in my life is whether or not I feel like doing it. That's not having an inexhaustible grace. But if love drives my interactions with other people, then inexhaustible grace becomes a reality. It becomes something that could be a possibility. If we truly value and cherish an exhaustible grace... We truly cherish and value one another. We'll let love drive it and motivate it and guide it. And it'll draw us closer into relationship with the Lord and closer in relationship with one another. So love must drive our, must motivate our interactions. It's also got to motivate our generosity. Look at 2 Corinthians 8.4. 2 Corinthians 8, excuse me, 8.24. So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. Now, if I've ever read a verse out of context, that would be one of them. You're like, what in the world's going on? Paul is taking up a collection. So the Jerusalem church has is, is been hit with uh, poverty, probably through persecution, and they need help. And so Paul's planted all these churches, and he's writing to all of his churches, and he's saying, hey, I'm going to take up a collection, I'm going to come and visit you, and then I'm going to take all that money, and I'm going to go to Jerusalem and give it to the church there. And we're in 2 Corinthians, and in 1 Corinthians, he first kind of mentioned it the church, and they had started giving, and then they kind of stopped. 
And it's not because they were running out of money. They were running out of something else that's much more valuable. They were running out of love. They were running out of love. They kind of got tired of doing it. If you go back and read 8.24, it says, So give proof before the churches of what? Your love. Give proof of your love and our boasting about you to these men. When you give, it's an evidence of how much you love. Of the fact that you love, maybe, is a better way to say that. Now, not how much you give. If you give more, obviously you love more. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. But I give to things that I care about. I give my time, my energy, my talents, my abilities to things that I care about. If I don't care about it, I don't give my time to it, I don't give my money to it. Paul is saying here that proof of our love is what we give, whether that's financial resources, whether that's uh, your time, your talents, your ability, whatever. We need to be a church that's motivated by love and that shows our generosity, rather shows our love by our generosity. That's why we value overflowing generosity. We want our partners to know that we love them. We want our calling and for the nations and, and uh, ACT and Brother Bill's Buckner, these other places that we, we give so, we want to just bless them so much with volunteers and with resources. We want to put missionaries on the mission field. We want to plant churches. You got a lot of students come up here. And I don't know if you remember what it's like to be a student, but it was hard. And I am pretty confident it's harder now than it was then. And we got a ministry that wants to help you disciple and motivate and, and teach your children the gospel. They're not going to do it for you, but they want to help you. And that takes resources. So we must be a church that gives because I know you love the students. You love missions. And you love one another. And so we give. We give. If we love the work of Christ, our checkbooks will show it. If we don't, it will show it also. Love also needs to engage our thinking. What do you think about on a daily basis? What's going through your mind? For me, I'm usually thinking about how to make somebody laugh and how to teach them something, and which is why I probably do what I do. I get a chance to do both right up here in front of you. Clearly, I didn't think long enough about that joke. So <laughs> I need to take that one back. Maybe you think about a hobby that you have. Um, Paul in... in uh, 1 Corinthians 9.22, turn over to 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul in that passage, he says, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Paul thought a lot about how to help people that were far away from the gospel become closer to the gospel. Whether they were Jew or Gentile didn't matter, whether they were rich or poor didn't matter, man, woman didn't matter. He wanted to find creative ways to help people come to know Jesus Christ. I don't know what you spend your time thinking about. I don't know what I spend my time thinking about very often. But we need to be people who are willing to courageously innovate, to come up with new ways of doing things. And the reason why is not so that we can be the cool, sexy church. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is be a church that reaches people outside of our walls. The world has changed. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the world has changed since the church was planted in 1939. We had a world war since then. The world is different. In fact, I would say the world is different than it was when this service was started in the mid-2000s. The world is changing, and we don't change truth or our values to keep up with the world. That's not what I'm talking about. But we do change the way we do things in order to reach other people. And so we don't need to just be a people that are cool with change, like, all right, fine, if you're going to change something, that's okay with me. No, we need to be a people that are like, yes, let's change. What's the newest thing we can do? How can we innovate? How can we be better? How can we be a people that loves uh, people outside of our walls better? And if you want to know, I am not a futurist. I don't like change. I fear it with every fiber of my being. The boogeyman is change to me. But I also recognize and do my best. I stretch myself. I challenge myself to be somebody that doesn't just embrace change, but advocates for it. And so if you are a leader in a ministry area, if you're a volunteer, I'm going to talk to you real quick. 
and you have a staff person or you've got leaders in your ministry area that want to change something and they tell you it's because they want to reach people who aren't there or who isn't there, it's okay to have pushback. But help them change. Help them either by, if, even if you disagree, say, hey, how can I help you? How can we make this a reality? I don't know that that's going to work, but what about this? Don't just say no. Say, okay, cool, I'm on board. How do we make this in a way that I think is going to work too? We have to be a people that courageously innovates. We have to be. We have to be. Then lastly, love must govern our schedules. Love must govern our schedules. I, if you're like me, uh, you have a very busy schedule. And your schedule's probably jam-packed. My family's in town this week, and one of the things that my mom and dad often say to me is they don't know how uh, my wife and I have time to do all the things that we do. The answer is we don't do any of it well, is probably the, the answer. Uh, no, we, we have very busy schedules, and you have a very busy schedule as well, right? But do we have schedules that are oriented towards reaching people? Do you have time in your schedule to go after people and show them that you love them? Do you set aside time to encourage and build up the body of believers? Do you set aside time to pursue those that don't know Christ? In John 9, 4, Jesus says, night is coming when no one can work. And the context of that passage is he's just healed a man who was born blind. He's just healed a man that was born blind. He's made them whole by them coming to know him. And our opportunities to make people whole, to help people find Christ, that's a limited window. You get 80 to 100 years, tops. And then you will die. And prayerfully, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will go to heaven. And there you will worship him. But one of the ways that you won't be able to worship him is by telling people that don't know Christ about Christ. That opportunity will have been closed to you. You have a limited window. Night is coming where none of us can work. So we have a sense of urgency. We have a relentless urgency to go after people who don't know Christ, who don't know Christ. So those are our values. Boundless gospel, inexhaustible grace, overflowing generosity, courageous innovation, and relentless urgency. So what do we do then? We've talked some things we can do, but I want us to talk about it in a, in a fashionable sense, I suppose. Look at Colossians 3.14. We need to put on our values. Let's put on our values. Colossians 3.14. We just read 3.12 through 13, but 14 says this, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The Greek verb there, uh, put on, it's like getting dressed. It's putting on clothing. So if we think about love, I want you to think about love as the clothing that you wear. So pants, shirt, dress, it's necessary. You put on clothes. They need to go out to do whatever it is that you're going to do. Please put on clothing. It helps all of us uh, to interact with you in an appropriate fashion. The Greek word means literally to put on. But I want us to think about our other values. So remember, love was the highest value. I want us to think about our other values as accessories that we put on. We live in North Dallas, right? We accessorize. We got our watches. We got our smart watches. We got our jackets. We're stylish. So I want us to think about our values as accessories that we put on. So let's put on a gospel that is boundless. These are like eyeglasses. Most of us probably wear some sort of corrective lens. I do not be jealous. I do not. I can tell they're going, though. My last, uh, my last eye exam in the Army was like, yeah, you probably need some glasses. I'm like, I'm fine. Leave me alone. So we need eyeglasses, and the eyeglasses we need are glasses that help us see people the way that God sees them. And that's what the boundless gospel is. It helps us see people, people that we like, people we don't like, people that we're married to, people that we're rooming with, whatever the case is. We see people the way that God sees them. And how does God see them? Now, the answer that we typically throw out is God loves them. He loves them. And that's true. But God also looks at them as, so, as that, that he loves them so much that he willingly dies for them. We need to start seeing people and being willing to die for them, to let, set aside our own preferences for them. So let's put on a gospel that's truly boundless. Let's put on grace that's inexhaustible. Let's put on great grace that is truly inexhaustible. So when you go out in the morning, you've gotten dressed, and probably one of the last things you grab is some sort of travel mug, thermos, uh, that has your favorite beverage in it, maybe a, a coffee or a tea, mine's Diet Coke. Uh, and so I grab that, off I go. 
And, and if you think about inexhaustible grace, inexhaustible grace is one of those things that you need to drink from often, right? You don't just pound that coffee in one drink. No, you, you take sips from it throughout the morning and it helps you get through your morning, right? Inexhaustible grace is like that. You're going to encounter people throughout your day that challenge you, that maybe are rude to you. And the reaction that we want to have is we want to snap back at them. But if I drink from inexhaustible grace, I won't. I'll forgive them. Maybe you have a sin in your life that you struggle with a lot. And it seems like every other week you're just giving in to this temptation. And you're like, God, why, why? And you're really hard on yourself and you hate yourself for it. Maybe take a drink of inexhaustible grace and see that God loves you and is gracious to you and will supply you with the needs that you have. And he forgives you if you confess your sins and repent. So let's put on grace that's truly inexhaustible. Because if we're going to be a people of inexhaustible grace, we're going to need to fill up on that grace often. And if you don't believe you're actually forgiven, nobody else will either. And nobody else will believe that they're forgiven. Let's put on generosity that's overflowing. I think it's interesting that in my wallet here, right next to one another, in fact, they face one another, the symbol of my identity is here, my driver's license, and the symbol of my purchase power, my materialism, is right next door. My identity and my materialism are basically roommates in my wallet. And very often in our lives, what we can buy, what we can purchase, what we can spend our money on dictates who we are. If we're doing well financially, then I feel important, I feel powerful. If I'm not doing well financially, I don't feel that way. If you're ever going to be a person who tells your money what to do and what it is, rather than allowing your money to tell you what you are, you've got to be generous. You've got to put on a wallet that actually opens and gives to the needs of others. Because if you have a wallet that opens to the needs of other people, you have a heart then that opens to the needs of other people. Jesus tells us where our heart is, there our treasure is also. I'm going to combine the last two because they're related. Uh, there was a uh, courageous innovation, relentless urgency. There was a day, when this may sound like a shock to you, there was a day where people only used cell phones and only used phones to talk. It was a mystical world that archaeologists still aren't sure it actually existed. But there was a group of people who one day saw and envisioned in their mind a world where everybody was on this thing. And lo and behold, here we are. Everybody's tied to their cell phone. Many of you live and exist in a world and in a place, maybe in a family, maybe in a work situation, maybe in your own heart where you can't see a future that doesn't exist. So for instance, you have a family member that you've been trying to get to come to church. You have a friend that you want to come to church. You have a friend that you want them to accept Christ. And you're like, I just don't ever see it happening. You need to innovate. You need to see like those inventors of the cell phone who are like, I see a world. You need to see a world where that person is coming and just never give up. Be relentless in pursuing them. Give that relentless urgency. Don't stop. Don't, don't stop chasing after them. Whatever sin it is that you struggle with, picture a world where you don't have that and chase after it. I don't usually say positive things about cell phones, but this is a great reminder that you have with you all the time that you serve a creative God and you bear his image and creatively you are encouraged to share the gospel with people. Find new ways of doing things. Don't just sit on your own. And do it quickly. Let's have a sense of urgency. Let's chase after it passionately. I don't know what God is telling you to do today. My hope is that by hearing about values, especially by hearing about love, that God... The, the voice of the Lord is telling you to do something today. Maybe it's something in your family. Maybe it's something here at the church. If you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't have a relationship with him, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that is the only way for you to have a relationship with God, if you don't believe that, I've got your first step for you. You need to come to the next steps room. Come and talk with me. Just talk with me. You don't have to make a decision there. Just come and talk to me. Talk to some other ministers. You don't even have to talk to me. Maybe you think tweed's weird. That's cool. You talk to somebody else. We want to talk to you about your relationship with Christ. Maybe you need to get baptized. Guess what? If you're not baptized, but you have a relationship with Christ, you're disobedient. 
You need to have relentless urgency to go get baptized. There's no reason to put it off. You might be waiting to go get baptized in the Jordan. It's water, man. The water that fills up the Jordan is the same one that fills up the Trinity River. It's called the water cycle. Look it up. It's the same stuff. Get baptized. Walk in obedience to the Lord. Maybe you just need to join the church. Come on. You've been coming here a while, and you're like, well, this is our place. Commit. Commit. Join the church. Help us make these values a reality. Help us love better and richer and deeper. And help us be a people who have a boundless gospel, inexhaustible grace, overflowing generosity, relentless urgency, and courageous innovation. And may we see the Lord be glorified in our midst. Let's pray. Father God, you are good to us because you have blessed us immensely and immeasurably with your word and with the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would move in our hearts, that we would feel love and compassion for you and for those in our church, outside of our church, that we would be a people of love and we would be filled to the brim. And love would drive us and motivate us and we would live out the values that we have, not just as a people, but as a person devoted to you. We love you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.